Um, hello, you're Regal Kivanok. <laughs> I tried. Um, so, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Jorge, and today I'm going to talk about testing in production with JavaScript. Welcome to GSConf, Budapest, and thanks for coming to my talk. Oh, hidden slide. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, I promise the talk is not going to be um, too heavy, and let's get started. So, quick about me. My name is Jorge. I'm an engineer. Um, I'm from Spain, and I'm currently working in, uh, at Bristol. Um, started working on autonomous indoor navigation, UABs, and managed area of vehicles, drones. Um, then got back to the cloud space for years working at a startup called Bitnami that just got acquired by VMware, so kudos to my team, and now currently working at Dyson. So, I always like to start the talks. Uh, with a quick poll to know how the audience um, is doing on, on this topic. Um, I want to know how many of you know what JavaScript is. OK, thank you. No raising the hands over there? Um, are here for the city, the food, the party, and just a bit of JavaScript. <laughs> OK, that's fine. Um, know what testing is? We're raising the bar. No, about the testing pyramid, or any other way of classifying the different testing levels? Yeah, most of you, thank you. Um, who has a production environment? <laughs> Again, every one of you, amazing. Who is afraid of testing in production? Who is not afraid of testing in production? Good, good, this is coming so well. Um, are you testing your services in production? Not so many, but yeah, quite a few. That's great. Um, pref the final prefer spaces to tabs. Yes, yeah, spaces, right? <laughs> so, this talk, what's this talk about? This talk is about. Uh, I'm gonna try to answer uh, some frequently uh, asked questions about testing and your production uh, workloads. I'm not going to be too technical. I'm not going to deep inside any JavaScript code. And it's all based on the experience I gained working at Dyson. I've been working at Dyson for almost two years now. And, and yeah, it has been great. And we have learned a lot about testing in production. So this is a quick summary of what I'm, gonna, I'm going to answer. Um, why do you need testing in, test in production? What's the right testing level? Um, how can JavaScript or Node.js work uh, help with this? Um, how to avoid disrupting the real users? Because if you're testing in production, um, you're going to be part of your users. Um, you're going to be using production systems. How to keep um, how to keep your tests out of the statistics reports and out of metrics? Um, so when you report to your to your manager or to hire the business, um, you then get skewed results, and then why you should clean up and what happens if you don't, because that happened to us. So, yep, yeah, let's dive in a bit. <laughs> why do you need testing in production? Well, that's a good question, but I hope most of you can answer that. But really, what do I mean, why, uh, what do I mean by testing in production? Um, when you deploy your application, uh, it could be an application, a service, it could be a Lambda, whatever thing you deploy to production and has, uh, so the public has access to it, um, you need to guarantee it continues to work over the days and over the hours. And uh, it's not just it passed the unit test, it passed the service level test or whatever, and then I deploy and I don't care about my service. The service is running in production, and if something happens to it, you want to get notified, um, not by the users, but by some automated system. Um, so the idea about this is to have some kind of testing tool that runs uh, on a scheduled basis. Um, so it's testing your service like it was a real user. And if something happens, so the test fails, it means that a real user wasn't able to do one of the actions you have defined for your production services. And, and then you get a notification. So let's, let's dive into it a bit. Why really do you need a testing? Do you need testing in production? So here's a quick sample. Um, it might seem dumb, but it can happen. So imagine you have a Lambda function that returns the current date, right? And well, it doesn't cater for the year 2038 problem, which is when you are storing your date in a, 
a signed 32-bit uh, um, variable, uh, you run out of space to store the date, and then uh, you overflow right on the 16th of January 2038. Um, so yeah, you do your deployment, you write unit tests for it, uh, it should return a date. Uh, if you query for the date again, it should return a different number, it should return a different date. Um, yeah, the, your, your unit tests are fine, you deploy it, and after a handful of years, it starts failing. <laughs> And it's because uh, it, it has dynamic input-output. It depends on, 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 on the current time, on how the users are interacting with that service or what that service is returning dynamically. But going to a more real uh, situation, imagine one of your stateful services. So it's a service that stores some state on your users or on your database or um, on the state of your system. Then suddenly, by a bug or whatever, becomes inconsistent and then it starts failing for all the customers. Then what you will have is a horde of customers chasing you, angry customers saying, this is not working, I pay for it, um, but you don't want that. You want something that is not gonna get angry at you, and it's a robot, an automated process, that's gonna behave like a user, it's going to test your things, uh, your services in production and tell you when something bad happens so you don't get the feedback um, from the users. And so um, if you compare these two situations, so imagine you are in the first situation where you don't have an automated test system in production um, and then something bad happens and all your customers come to you uh, saying this is not working and, and claiming back the money. Um, it's going to take some time for the users to report to you that an error is happening and they have to go uh, to your service uh, help desk or log an issue or log a ticket or send you an email or whatever. So it's uh, slow. You don't know your service is failing until you get the feedback from the users. Uh, but if you have an automated system that runs every minute, every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, um, you get notifications about your system not working like this. And also, you, if you're in the first situation, you're losing money because the, m the more time you last in detecting that your systems are not working, uh, that's money that you're losing. And, and also, you're paying the support, the support team, um, a lot for dealing with those things where you could have catch the error beforehand. And also, the final, the final comparison is uh, about the company reputation. So if you have all the users coming back at you and saying, this is not working, this is how I pay for this, blah, 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 um, your company reputation is over the, over the floor. And, and then if you have an automated system that uh, notifies you right away of an issue in your production systems, nobody needs to um, notice it, and then you fix it quickly, and then customers are happy. So that's the comparison, and why do you need testing in production? Um, so what really is the right level of testing you want to perform in production? Um, because uh, you don't want to mess with real data, but you're using real systems. Yeah. So th this is uh, the testing pyramid. Well, one of the many testing pyramids are. <laughs> um, but let me focus on let me focus on this one because it's one of the simplest uh, that I found. It comes from from an article in uh, from from the website Automation Automation Panda, and um, at the bottom you have unit tests, then integration tests or service level tests, however you want to call them, and then the end to end tests. Um, so what happens when you have the unit test, you run the unit test before you deploy your application. So you test the single functions of your application or your service. And then you deploy your application because you are confident that your application is working fine because you have unit tested it. Um, but then when you deploy, um, you perform some integration tests or service level tests. So you're focusing on a single service. That single service is the minimum unit after deployment for us, the engineers, you deploy several services. And so these end-to-end -end tests, uh, sorry, these integration tests or several level tests are for those single units from the engineering side. But what the user sees is like the whole system and the user has user intents, user actions, or also called user journeys. 
uh, that are testing things across all the system, across all your services. Um, so that's the kind of uh, level I'm referring when I'm talking about testing in production. You want to become a real user. You want to be in the skin of a user and try all the possible actions a user can do to make sure your system still works as expected. How can JavaScript or Node.js help with that? Well, um, this is where my example comes into, into show. Um, so at the moment, I'm working at Dyson. And we have more than one million connected machines performing actions against the cloud and calling our services, calling our web APIs, our lambdas, blah, blah, blah. Um, and also users all around the globe um, doing actions and performing actions just like renaming your robot from Dyson 360i to Megasocket 9000, whatever. Um, and then uh, what happens is that uh, it's a big system. It's a form of uh, several moving parts. And I want to make sure that users can change the name of the robot and don't get an error, right? So I need a tool that's fast, that's easy to run uh, in production. So when I want to verify that all the user actions, all the user journeys are working in production. I, I run the tool like this, a Docker container or whatever. It's not difficult to deploy. I want it to be extendable also. Um, so when I write new services, I write new web APIs, um, whatever. I can add new libraries or new files and add in those testing uh, situations. And also, I would like to have the ability to write uh, behavior-driven uh, development tests, if you want to call them like that. Um, so really, what I want to define what the scenario of a real user is, what a real user is going to, how a real user is going to interact with my systems, and, and then uh, try to reproduce that automated, uh, simulating those virtual users, simulating everything, but not emulating the cloud, not emulating my services. The solution that we come to a place uh, was um, a tool written in, in, in JavaScript using Node.js. Um, and the main libraries uh, that we are using are Cucumber.js and the request library, well, also a bit of the ASL library. And basically, what we try to define a lot of single steps, a lot of single actions, and then using Cucumber.js, and, and then putting all those actions together into a group to form an X scenario, you're going to see now. Um, and yeah, then using the request library just to make requests over the internet, HTTP or HTTPS requests, and the assert library to assert that the values we are getting back are the, the ones that we expect. This is uh, an example of, uh, of the Cucumber, of a, a scenario written in Cucumber.js, or well, an, an X scenario really. I want to test that given an existing user with this configuration, and the user logs in, and the user changes the robot name to whatever, then the, one, the robot name has changed. I want to test that. That's a, it's a user action. I'm not testing one service. I'm not, test, I'm not testing one function. I'm testing the user journey. I'm testing the user intent. And that's what we want. We want to um, try and do what the users will be doing in, in production with our systems. Um, this is a very simple schema of uh, how it works. We have the users. The users, at the moment, interact with a, a smartphone application. Um, that smartphone application sends commands to the cloud, and then the cloud communicates the commands back to the, to the robot, to the cleaning robot, for example. And our testing tool, amazing testing tool, AKI, ATT, uh, has virtual users because they are not real users, have a virtual a smartphone app um, that is making the calls to the cloud and back, and it's also emulating the, the robot. So we are simulating all the points in production except the cloud, our services in production. That's, we want to behave like users. But um, if you test in production, um, Basically, you are stressing your production systems. You are becoming a user. And if you run your test in production very fast or you do a lot of actions, um, you become like a million users talking to your services at a given time. And you don't want that. 
Um, so you need to keep a balance between what you are testing in production and what you want to assert. Um, you don't want. It's good that you are very close to the to the user and to the real actions, but you need to to balance it, right? Um, so, for it, as an example of this, um, when we were writing the test, um, we started doing tests like every five minutes, I guess, if I recall. Um, and what happened is that we started get lean, getting a slowdowns on our web APIs because we were querying the web APIs every five minutes, doing a lot of tests, and then it was slowing down our production uh, services, and we don't, wa we don't want that for the users. And also, we experienced uh, some DynamoDB throttling, so database throttling, as our testing was doing calls to, to the API very fast and, and, to the, and reads and writes to DynamoDB. Uh, or the database, then we got throttle, and that was affecting users. So you need to be careful about that. You need to space a bit your end-to-end -end tests. Um, so the more often you run them, the faster you're going to realize that you have an issue, if there's an issue. Um, but then you get more noise, because you get more noise on the logs, you get more noise on the metrics, you get more, more noise everywhere. And it slow down, it slows down your production system, um, so you want to keep a balance about that. Um, and just this is another another quick bit. Um, when for this testing tool, we are simulating these users, so um, we have code in JavaScript how a user will behave, what APIs will the user hit, and what does the user want to do, uh, like for example, changing the name of the robot, and um, yeah, as I said, we want to test the real user behavior. Okay, um, so basically, yeah, again, when you run your tests in production, um, you are becoming a, another user, you are becoming um, part of, of, of the system, and it could skew your metrics, um, for example, um, the number of users interacting with your system. You want to report to your manager or to the business um, how many users are using your your production services. But if you have this end-to-end -end test running uh, in production, then that's skewing your result. Also, if you want to know how many uh, calls to an API, um, and also the error count. So, for example, you are very interested on how many times your uh, API is returning a 500 or is returning a 400. If you have the end-to-end -end test, that's going to skew your result. So, you need a way of keeping those tests that you know about them, that you are generating them, keeping them out of the statistics. And you could also get mixed logs. So, if you have a logging utility that's put, that puts all the logs together, um, like um, Splunk or Elasticsearch, um, how do you discern which logs were part of the end-to-end -end test or which logs were part of real users doing real actions? Um, so yeah, you need to be careful with that. How can we um, how can we keep our tests out of the statistics? We could use a correlation ID. So with every request, we would send. Um, as part of the request, a correlation ID, or we will generate a correlation ID that's going to be passed between the different services internally. So every service, if they see the correlation ID starting by end-to-end FFFFF, um, they're going to know it's part of the test. Um, they shouldn't behave differently, but at least not logging metrics, for example, or logging metrics to a different namespace. We could also change the user agent in case of uh, web APIs um, by yeah, specifying instead of being Mozilla, Gecko, whatever, um, you have your application and to end test and the version. And finally, you can also add new HTTP headers. That, uh, nobody's going to um, freak about that. You just put test to version 1.1, 1.2, or whatever, and then you treat them differently, you not treat them differently, you don't lock the metrics if you see the header coming in into your production systems. Right, so after everything, um, this, uh, um, this was a quick introduction to how to run end-to-end -end tests in production. Um, you now have your end-to-end -end tests running in production. They are executing every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, 
and they are passing. That's great. But what about all the fake data they have generated? So they, they were virtual users or virtual machines, virtual smartphone apps that were creating new users, that were creating uh, new cleans, new, new data to our production systems. And, and that's fake data. We don't really want it in, in the system. And it's making some, it's, 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 it's going to cause a problem in the long run. Um, so for example, um, we were logging, um, when you register a machine into the cloud, into the services, um, we store a, a row in the database saying this machine is now, does now six and belongs to this user. Um, so as we were executing the end-to-end -end in production, we were creating new machines with new users, random machines, random users, blah, 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 blah. And we were filling the database. Um, and what happened was that our services in production were querying that database and, and getting all those users. And the services were expecting to find between 1 and 90 entries, different entries in production. but we were generating a lot of entries every single day. So the entries ended up like being in the order of 1,000 entries. What happened that our service was not prepared to do any pagination, and then it started failing for the customers because we couldn't find the entries because they were in the page six or page seven because all the tests, all the tests in production were generating more data and filling up the database. Um, and that's a problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, you need to clean that data. Uh, it's very important. And you want to do that automatically, if possible, after every single test run. Um, um, so it, it helps to, to keep your environment clean. It helps to start the, test, the next test, to start them from a clean state, avoid cluttering your, your databases or cluttering your, your services, or exhausting any other limited resources like um, IDs or yeah any 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 other limited resources you you could have in your production system and um, and also avoid as an example I just put avoid making real data more difficult to query to retrieve and to search so as a recap testing in production is good and necessary please do it if you are not doing it. Um, you need to think uh, as a real user to put yourself in, in the skin of a user and act like a user so that you are really testing your your system. Then using the framework Cucumber JS is a good start um, and we found that it worked for us and it's, it's amazing. You need to think also about your system capacity. So if your system cannot handle a thousand requests per second, then you shouldn't be doing that many end-to-end -end tests space them a bit every half an hour, every f 45 minutes, whatever fits you. Um, you also want to mark your test intents uh, to differentiate them from the, from the production load from the real users uh, with the correlation ID or with the HTTP header or any other, any other solution. And after that, you want to clean your test data and reset every connections or every any status you might have changed after after this test. Um, and that's all basically. Um, thank you for for listening. Um, one more thing, I would like to take a bit more into by Will Smith for the gram selfie. Um, I'm doing it right now because I have plenty of spare time. So now I smile. I hope I can fit everyone. Yeah, amazing. And way. <laughs> Thank you, but just wait. Um, are you brave enough to test in production? Are you? Can I hear you? <laughs> well, um, yeah, so now the applause. Thank you.